fan meetup portion of it. So we just got passport photos taken on Polaroids. Can you see? There you go. Um, and then we're in line to get our Grishaverse passports, which should be super fun. And then later on there's going to be a book talk and a signing. Strand Bookstore, the books have been loved for 91 years and counting. <laughs> That's a long time. Uh, tonight we're excited to be welcoming the prolific, iconic, and absolutely inimitable best-selling author, Lee Bardugo, for the launch of the new <laughs> book, King of Scars. I told her to come out at applause. So. <laughs> Some of Lee's previous works include the Shadow and Bone trilogy, the Six of Crows duology, and the Language of Thorns. Her short stories can be found in multiple anthologies, including The Best of Tor.com and The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Her other works include Wonder Woman, Harbor Harbinger. Warbringer. Harbinger. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the forthcoming Ninth House. We're going to cut this intro out of the video. And anyway, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lee Bartugo to the stage. conversation for about a half hour 45 minutes or I would read um, but then the thing we found was we never really had time for Q&A I would always run out 
Um, so I'm hoping you guys came with questions. They can be about anything. They can be about the books. They can be about the adaptation, although there's not that much I can tell you about it. Um, it can be about stuff you like or that you're reading. Um, and I also had asked, just in case people were shy, that we put a bowl out. So I'm going to alternate between crowd questions and the bowl questions, and hopefully there's nothing obscene in there. Or maybe, hooray, there's something obscene in there. So... Does anybody want to be the first to ask me a question? Don't be shy. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so was it hard for you to get back into sort of Nikolai's head? This is Clarabelle, by the way. Yeah. Clarabelle Ortega, she has, um, a, she's a writer and an awesome human. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, the question was about getting into Nikolai's know. head. And now I'm like blushing. <laughs> um, yeah. Getting back into Nikolai's head and sort of like the Grisha verse before, like all of those characters, you know, was it hard for you after Six of Crows and everything? Honestly, it really wasn't. I mean, it was, when I was writing Crooked Kingdom, originally there were much longer scenes with the Grisha first character, the original Shadow and Bone trilogy characters, because it was so fun to write them again. And um, I think the thing that was, I had actually never written from Nikolai's POV. And so for me, the challenge was in creating a tension between the person that we see, who is charming and glib and always has an answer and always has a plan, and the cost that has for him. And I'm hoping that will resonate with people who know what it's like to sort of put on this brilliant front and sometimes be crumbling inside. So, you know, I want him to suffer. <laughs> What's the point if they're not in pain, you know? Um, so that was the real challenge of that. And I have to say too, I was, it was actually quite hard to be in Nina's set again because of things we won't speak about. Um, I'm not sorry, guys. <laughs> not sorry at all. Um, but, I, but my punishment was essentially having to write from a perspective of grief. And if any of you have lost somebody in your lives, which I think most of us have, and as you get older, you lose parents, um, you lose friends, it, it's a very hard place to go. But then the great pleasure was being in Zoya's head, and I did not expect to like writing her so much. My oh God, I loved writing her. She is so mean. <laughs> and she takes no crap from anyone, and she's just, she is a general to her core, and I really loved writing her, and she was a surprise, so yeah. Okay, from the bowl. Can you talk about Ninth House? Catherine from the Philippines, stir on on Tumblr! Hello! Are you welcome? Hello! I, this defeats the purpose of being like, are you shy? Um, <laughs> allow me to draw as much attention to you as possible. Um, yes, thank you for asking. Um, Ninth House is my novel, um, my first novel for adults. Um, I stopped saying adult novel because it sounds dirty. Um, it's coming out and on October 1st. I just saw the cover for it and I love it so much. It's very different from our other covers, but y'all are gonna understand why I love it so much when it, when it goes live. Um, and it's uh, my story of, the, of murder and dark magic and the occult among the secret societies of Yale University. Um, and it's a book that's been brewing since I was a freshman in college, and it's about power and privilege and horrible, delightful, amazing, magical things happening. So I'm really excited about it. And I know it's really hard to go from one series to another, but I hope you guys will follow me there because this book means so much to me. Um, and that is my plea to you. All right, <laughs> who else has a question? Yes. Oh, oh, you first and then we'll go to you. Yeah. Um, I know you can't really talk about, uh, Michelle, by the way. Hello, Hi. Michelle. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you. Also, um, you have amazing glasses. Thank you. I also have amazing hair. Yes. <laughs> so I know you can't really talk too much about the show, but who would be your dream cast? You don't have to say for everyone, maybe just a couple of characters, but okay. if there's someone that you would really, really love. I am imagine. sorry to disappoint you, but the one thing that Netflix said was, please don't talk about your dream cast because... If I say that, whoever gets cast, if it's not that person, is going to be like, <laughs> hey guys, you know, like, I don't, I want, look, I can tell you this, um, I think that it's really important, I can prompt, okay, <laughs> there will be no whitewashing, this, 
There will be no skinny washing. There will be no okay? Eric Heisler is very dedicated not only to having diversity in the show, but to having diversity in the writer's room as well. And he is, the right, he is great. Um, and, uh, and I think for us, it's about finding really fantastic actors, um, maybe who haven't been discovered yet, and who are now going to get an opportunity, hopefully, to be in some awesome fight scenes, and some magical scenes, and romantic scenes, and um, all I can say is we, we sat down recently to talk through the first season, and he has so many cool things in store. Like, if he does half of what he's talking about doing, like, your minds will be blown. <laughs> all right. You bet. <laughs> okay. This is a long one. How do you decide what your characters have been through? Trauma, backstories? Yes, trauma. <laughs> and do you have any tips on writing relationships that center around trauma or mistrust? The relationships don't have to be romantic. They could also be about platonic or parental. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, because I think some of the most important relationships in books and in my books are the friendships. And I think one of my favorite characters to write in Crooked Kingdom was Colm Fahey, um, Jesper's dad. In fantasy, we have a really bad habit of just killing parents off or them being really horrible. And I write a lot of horrible parents, but writing a really good dad was just like, I loved my dad and like getting to do that was very emotional and um, just made me happy. Like I wanted to write a really supportive, awesome parent, you know, um, and then make him suffer. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that, I guess there's a couple of things I would say. Um, there's a difference between writing trauma respectfully and writing trauma exploitatively. And I think we have to be as conscious as we can be about the things we're putting characters through and what the real life repercussions of those things are, right? There is no magic bullet for PTSD. There is no magic bullet for harm that's been done to you in the past. Um, I have tried to be as respectful as I can of these things that take time and that you don't solve or cure, you learn to live with them. Um, and I think part of it is ac accessing suffering in your own past, but I think it's also doing a kind of um, respectful research. And I think also, don't play tourist in other people's lives. Like, if you're committed to writing about something, be committed to writing about something, and sometimes understand that it may not be your thing to write. Which is what no author wants to hear, but sometimes we have to. Okay, serious <laughs> Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are next. So, following Caitlin's question, will Ninth, Ninth House have some dirty in it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, <laughs> not the kind of dirty you're thinking about. Um, it's not, nobody has that kind of fun in my books. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I managed to write so many books without people even kissing. <laughs> like, um, uh, I, uh, no. But also, yes. <laughs> Ninth House is went some dark places. Is all I'm gonna. It, you surprised? Um, it went some really dark places that sort of took me aback. Um, and it turned out, you know, I always when I'm sitting down to write. Hello. I was when I'm sitting down to write a book. I always think I'm going to write a fun romp, like in my head, I think I'm going to write some kind of just like, like when I sat down to write Six of Crows, I was like, this is going to be a delightful heist in the vein of Crows 11. And then, you know, a kid is, you know, riding his brother's body to freedom. It's <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't set out to write something that's dark or gritty or angsty, but I think these things come up because when you start to talk about things like trauma or things like um, what it is to be a young woman in college right now, a lot of heavy shit comes up, pardon my French. And, um, and I think that that works its way in there. There is going to be romance, um, but it is slow burn because I love a slow burn. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows, maybe in the next book I will write a lot of sexy times. <laughs> maybe I'll release some unedited scenes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I've, I've never really written a super, super dirty thing. You think I, 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 mean, I don't know. I like the lead up. Am I the only person who likes the lead up? No. Okay, bless. <laughs> I also feel like there's like a limited number of words that become available to you. Like, the rusting. Anyway. <laughs> okay. 
Legend of Old, for safety. Which order of Grisha would Alex be? Oh, yeah. I love all these nine house questions. My publicist was like, shut up. Um, we're here to talk about the Grisha verse. Alex Stern is the heroine of um, Ninth House. There's just no question that she's a Slytherin. She is, she is deep Slytherin. Like there's just, yeah, like I thought Kaz was dark, but nope. <laughs> um, somebody else, maybe in the, in the back, I see a, a, a Mortal Instruments room. Yes. How are you? I'm great, how are you? Good. I was wondering, I just did my reread of everything, honestly. <laughs> Thank you. And was Jesper based on Doc Holliday at all, except the tuberculosis? <laughs> okay. I've never thought about this. But Tombstone, it is a flawed film. But I love that movie. And I think there probably is a little bit. I can tell you that some, there's a scene where Wyatt just smacks a guy in the nose with the butt of his gun. And I just love, I grew up on that stuff, like The Untouchables and Tombstone, and you know, I, I love that stuff. Um, and I think a lot of that, the kind of trash talk, the gunfights, all work their way in there. So very astute. You know, not deliberately, but we pick things up. You know, we all have little trope buttons that get pushed, you know? And I think, how many here are writers? Do we have any? All right, I, so Marie Lou, I'm gonna name drop, Marie Lou and I were talking. And, um, and we were talking about the things that give us pleasure in stories, what makes us lock in, and, um, and that we, and sometimes you recognize it more in a movie that's not good or a show that's not good, but you're still like, I know this isn't good, but I love it. And it's really powerful, and I think it can be a guide in our writing because it tells us like, oh, maybe we should be writing that. Like maybe that's the thing that is going to bring us pleasure as writers and then give pleasure to the reader with the book. I'm sounding more and more filthy. Okay, to the bowl. Okay. What are the odds of the Six of Crows book three, uh, says Alexa. Um, they're really good, actually. Um, not soon. Um, I have a sequel to write for King of Scars. I have uh, the sequel to write for Ninth House. So it would be a few years. Um, but I have always thought that I would revisit those characters, and I have a rough idea of what the plot of that book would be, but it, I, it has to sit and cook. Writing heists and cons is incredibly challenging and exhausting and requires a level of attention and revision that is really hard to do on a tight deadline. Um, so I'm... If you guys are still around, I'll write it for you. <laughs> Not really! If you're, if you're still listening to me in a few years, I will absolutely write a Six of Crows 3. I'm going to <laughs> But don't camp out at my house. <laughs> um, someone else? Yes. Yellow shirt, yeah. Hi. Hi. So I'm not sure if you've answered this before in another interview, but which character from Six of Crows do you relate to the most? That is a really hard question. Um, there's a little bit of me in all of them. You know, some of the insecurities Wyland carries with him from growing up are definitely straight out of my head. That voice in his head that tells him he's not good enough. Same voice. I feel like Nina is me on my best days. Like the days when I'm like, I look up. Like, that's Nina every day. And of course, there's a lot of cats in me. Not so much in the ruthless mastermind. <laughs> I wish I was more ruthless and, and brilliant that way, but um, obviously his experience with chronic pain and disability is something that, you know, I wasn't conscious of writing it in the first book, which makes me sound so foolish, right? Like, obviously, I was writing a guy who lives with chronic pain and, and walks with a cane. Clearly, you're doing a self-insert, but I, I didn't. You know, I think there's a certain level of of just not being conscious of that uh, until I was done with the draft. But when I wrote Crooked Kingdom, I was much more conscious of that. And I was actually addressing some of the things I've heard about my own disability, and that I heard when people talked about Kaz. You know, they would say, you know, I don't know why, but I pictured Kaz as an old man. I was like, I know why. Because the media has taught you that the only people who need mobility devices are old. You know, it's why I get, you know, second looks in uh, the airport, you know, where people are like, you don't look disabled, you know, and I'm like, how does that look? Exactly. So I wrote a lot of that into Crooked Kingdom, and I think I, in some ways I got closer to Kaz in that, in that writing. Oh, to the bowl. Okay. Did you ever have a different ending for the Darkling? 
No, my sweet babies. <laughs> my sweet, sweet, monster-loving babies. Uh, he was always gonna bite it, so... Next. Thank you, next. Brittany. <laughs> then we'll go to the back. So, you write from other POVs really well, and I was wondering if you had any tips for like slipping into other characters' minds when you have to go back and forth. Um, look, I, at least for me, the trick is in revision. You know, one of the notes I got consistently from my editor was, these characters have to sound more different. And so that was the work of revision, because initially they all just sounded like me. And I'm very delightful, but you don't want to read six POVs that sound like me. So that was part of the work. And also I read them out loud. If you don't find yourself falling into a particular cadence when you're reading a character, you're not there yet. You will go. You know, the more you work on it, the more you revise. And there will be little parts where you find yourself finding the diction, finding the way that they talk. Um, you know, all characters don't use the same metaphors. They don't have the same sense of humor. They don't have the same level of education. And that has to be a part of your process when you're, when you're in their heads. So that's my best advice. Okay. And then if there's somebody in the back, I'm going to call on somebody in the back. <coughs> How do you decide which characters to use in some scenes? Which leg did Cass break? I don't remember. I know I'm supposed to know those things, but I don't remember. It's somewhere in the book. Um, I think it's his right leg, though. It's wherever Kevin Wada drew the cane, because I told him. <laughs> whichever, whichever hand he's holding it in. It's not a question of deciding which characters belong in a scene. Sometimes it's a question of information, and sometimes you end up with too many characters in a scene. I feel so guilty handing over my books to my audiobook narrator, Lauren Fortgang. Are you here? You're here! <laughs> Lauren Fortgang, stand up! <laughs> this is the voice of the great show. I love you. A bit. She narrated, she's been with us since Shadow and Bone, Language of Thorns, she's the voice of Inej, she's the best, and she narrated all of a very long book, which is King of Scars. Also, she told me she didn't read the last scene, I'm not spoiling anything, but she didn't read the last scene because she likes to not telegraph. She's afraid if she knows too much. So then she was basically said she was reading it for the thing and was like, ah! <laughs> yeah. And then she had no one to talk to. Um, I enjoy that. I, 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 here's the thing, I think we think of the process of writing as a series of these rational decisions, and some of them are, right? We're walking a line between this very analytical part of our brains that outlines and has to create structure and has to create plot and has to be thinking, you know, how is this going to work and where's the second act break? But there's another side of us that is writing from the gut, and that is the line we have to walk. And sometimes that gut is going to lead you, and it's going to tell you who's going to be on the scene. And other times you're going to have to think, all right, what what information do I need to convey, and who has the most to lose if they're in this scene, or who has the highest stakes if they're in this scene, or who is going to give me the most fun because I'm going to get to write the wittiest banter in this scene. So it can be anything that guides you, but that decision is usually the kind of thing that is going to come from your gut and that you have to open the door to, even if you're an outliner like me. Someone in the back? Uh, let's do the red shirt that says monsters, and then I see somebody with blonde hair and glasses. Yes, next, close to it. Uh, you kind of stole my thunder with Miss Fortgang, but I was going to ask, is that a fierce read, or is that your decision? Um, and Miss Fortgang, I would just like to say that I read, but when I can't read, I listen, and your voice is the most soothing. <laughs> it, it, you really bring every character to life, even the men in the first chapter, I listened all the way up, and it, your voice of the father was Ed. That's enough, we're here for me. <laughs> um, honestly, they sent me a bunch of narrators when we were doing Shadow and Bone, and I picked Lauren. I just right. knew. <laughs> and I'll be honest, I only listen very rarely to bits and pieces because I read my books out loud, and yeah, it's like there's something uncomfortable to me. I, I only reread my books when I have to. I had to reread everything before I wrote King of Scars, and it's incredibly uncomfortable because you evolve as a writer and you see the things you wish you'd done differently, and you want, it, you want to go back and edit it, but that's not the way it works. <laughs> and then I'll do a bold question. Hi. Um, so I was wondering how you force yourself to keep going with the plot sometimes when 
the characters may want to go a different way. And I know I, my writing, I struggle with that. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, if, you're, if something feels wrong for the characters, maybe you have to rethink where you think the plot is going. You know, maybe you have built, the, maybe these char characters have evolved into something that you didn't see coming. Nikolai was supposed to die in Siege and Storm. Okay? He was supposed to die at the end of it. Alina wasn't going to get framed for his murder. It was very dramatic. <laughs> but then I met him. And I was like, okay, you can stay. <laughs> Big nerd. Um, so sometimes you have to be guided by those things. But in general, I've had very few characters who took control of plot for me. I wish they would. You know, most of the time I feel like I am steering the ship. And I think if you're stuck, there are a lot of... You know, there's a lot of different techniques for, you know, going back to where you really felt sure of where you wanted to go next, before you started feeling bad about where the plot was going and sort of seeing maybe you took a few missteps, writing from a different POV. I love to go for a walk and talk to myself. That is my favorite thing to do. I put my little Bluetooth in. The neighbors know I'm the weird lady who just walks around talking. And that's, you know, that's basically what I do to try to get out of a, 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 of a slump if I'm not sure where the plot goes next. But I'm also an outliner. So if I don't like where something is, I'll jump to another part of the story. It makes for a challenging revision process, but the biggest challenge of being a new writer is discovering how you work, and that only comes with time. Okay, to the bowl. And then is there anybody in the front who has a question? Okay, we're gonna do a few here. <laughs> Can you talk about the possible rep in the show? I did. Asian Kaz, dark-skinned Inej. Caitlin, another Sturmland on Tumblr. Um, I don't know what the casting will be like for Kaz. I guarantee that Inej will be a woman of color. I don't know how she's going to be cast yet because we haven't started that, but I hear what you're saying and I will discuss it with Eric. Um, and I will tell you too, this is something I talked about in my newsletter, but the thing we're really focusing on is also bringing diversity to the cast of Shadow and Bone because that was, some, well, was a place that I dropped the ball. So this is a place where the show can do better. So do better, show. <laughs> All right, two more questions. Oh my God. Okay, you first, and then you. <laughs> you, but first you. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering one thing that you're looking forward to for the adaptation, and one thing you might be nervous about. <laughs> um, I am looking forward to. See the sets and <laughs> the costumes. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about where we've talked about shooting yet, but I don't know. I think every writer imagines that, like just the chance to walk in on, like walking on set at the little palace is just, you know, I'm gonna get emotional. Um, and something I'm nervous about, I mean all of it. Look, you know, we're in this magical honeymoon right now where everything looks great, but I, I know adaptation go, can go wrong and it's why we were very cautious about making this deal. I didn't just hand them Shadow and Bone or Six of Crows, I handed them the keys to the whole Reshaverse, and that's terrifying, but I, these were the right people to gamble with. So, y'all just stick with me and we'll do our best. <laughs> well, I'm very excited. I'm so glad, I'm glad you're excited. That shows them there. And then, you know what, we're gonna try to lightning round a few questions. So everybody who had their hands up, only the people who had their hands up think short versions of your questions and we'll lightning round it. Okay. Hi, um, I have a process question. Okay. How much do you reread other works when you're revising or even when you're just in the early stages of outlining or do you watch TV? Like what's, what other creative um, stories? I you? tend to watch things that have nothing to do with my work and read things. I'm usually reading nonfiction because I'm still in the research process all the way through to uh, when when the book is going out, like, um, and I don't like to read other fiction unless I'm really stuck and I need to be inspired, and then reading some really beautiful prose does the trick. But I tend to watch things that have nothing to do, like I watched, rewatched all of Parks and Rec when I was watching, when I was writing Six of Crows, hence the waffles. Um, <laughs> Um, but because I needed something light and that just felt that lifted my spirit. I'm a huge fan of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I'm a huge fan of Bob's Burgers. Like, they're the shows that make me feel good. Oh, Great British Bake Off. Like, it is the bomb for one soul, you know? It's like, it's so healing and I'm like, everything's gonna be okay. Maybe this bake didn't work out, but the next one is gonna go better, you know? 
no, okay. I that's that's where I need to be when I'm when I'm working. Okay, who had their hands up? Don't lie. All right, we're gonna lightning round it. Go, real short. Uh, research how? Research. How? <laughs> um, uh, uh, give yourself a, a certain amount of time you're going to research. Don't hide from the draft in the research because once you're writing, you're going to learn other things you need to research. And understand that research is basically a wide net that you're throwing and you're only going to cull certain things from it. Who up? Keep your hands up. You. Do I use humor as a coping mechanism? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All my life. Next. <laughs> Oh, um, I just read Queen of Nothing, the third book. <laughs> yeah, so. um, that was the third book in Holly Black's um, Cruel Prince, Wicked King, and it's so good. Yeah, it was really good. Um, I love that series. To me, it's basically like, it's everything I wanted from a series when I was younger. It's transportive, it's dangerous, it's sedu seductive. I just love it so much, so I'm super excited about that. And also, I feel like everybody's been sleeping on the Brooklyn Bruja series by Zora yes. and yes. It's really good and really fun, and I just want more people to read it, so please, go out and read it. Um, yes, quick. Might we yes. ever get a story with David and Jenya? Because I love them. I mean, they're in King of Scars, David and Jenya, and I love writing them. But will they get their own story? Maybe, that would be kind of fun. I could send them on a quest. <laughs> okay, now you. Yeah. They, I think they want to use it more for texture, okay. and and I don't actually know. There are certain things that I know are going to be in the show that I think readers are going to be super excited about, though. That's all I can say. You, and then you, and then we're done. Oh. All right. Yes. Yeah, and she did take a third amplifier. She killed him, too. Yeah. She's a stone-cold killer, is what she is. Um, yeah, I mean, a big part of the story, and I know it distressed a lot of people, was what the hunger for power does to you. And it doesn't matter if your motives are good. Most people don't start out being like, I will be evil. They start out thinking that they're doing a good job, or they that they know better than everyone else what's good for them. And the problem is that becomes addictive. So that is very much a part of the story is the lure of that power. Yes, Kefta, and then we're done. Um, so, no. Our plan right now is that many of the characters who were presumed white in the first trilogy will be played by mixed race um, actors or just actors of color who are not mixed race. It will be, again, we are trying to bring as much diversity as we can and we're also trying to be thoughtful about it because, okay, so, Full disclosure, when I went back and reread Shadow and Bone, there is a martial arts instructor in there named um, Bolio Bayor, who I love, but I realized I walked right into a trope, right? I walked right into a stereotype, which is I kill build it, right? Here's the white girl learning from her shoe instructor. How much does that change if that girl is half shoe or shoe, okay? It changes the dynamic, it makes it better. It's a better story. And that's the thing I think we have to remember about diversity. It's not about being do-gooders. It's about the fact that this is what the world looks like and stories are better for it. You know, as storytellers, we should want that. And as readers, we should definitely want that. Okay, babies. Thank you.